Hello, everyone. I'm Karen McNeil, author of The Wine Bible, and this is Winespeed.com's People to Know, insider interviews with the most fascinating and important people in the wine business. And today we're talking with Fritz Hatton. Fritz is the nation's most experienced wine auctioneer. He and his wife, Karen, own the Napa Valley winery Arietta, one of the, one of the Napa Valley's top Bordeaux-style wine producers. He is summa cum laude, graduate of Yale with a degree in English literature and an MBA from the Yale School of Organization and Man Management, excuse me. He began his career in Christie's wine department in 1980, where he remained on and off for about 20 years, moving from management to principal wine auctioneer. During several breaks from Christie's in the 1990s, Hatton briefly returned to his classical music studies, which he had begun at the young age of seven. Hatton joined Zaki's wine auctions in 2002, where he continues to conduct all commercial wine auctions, in addition to really hundreds of charitable auctions nationwide, and of course, overseeing Arietta Winery. Welcome Fritz. You're a busy person, a busy man. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. Let me <laughs> a little start bit more at home these days, but still working uh, quite busily from home. Yeah, aren't we all? That's true. Um, let me start by asking you, because you, um, you've, you're involved in so many aspects of the wine business, but did you grow up in a family that drank wine? Well, my father was a great wine lover and a Francophile. Uh, he never could keep much wine in the home because, well, he was a consumer, let's put it that way. So I was exposed to um, some great wine when I was growing up. And uh, as he considered himself a Francophile, of course, we were offered wine to drink or taste with dinner when we were, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, of course, mixed with a little water. Uh, so there it was. Yes, I did have that uh, exposure at home, although I didn't really get into wine until um, college. Yeah, well, you know, I want to jump ahead for a minute and say you were at Christie's, of course, the very famous auction house of Christie's early in your career, um, but how did you, I've always been curious about this, how did you learn to become an auctioneer? Because it seems like such a, a rarefied and difficult skill. Well, I never thought I'd be an auctioneer. I sort of stumbled into it um, because, well, because wine led me to Christie's and I was, once at Christie's, I was asked to try out for the auctioneering course or to take the auctioneering course and try out as an auctioneer. And I was sort of taken aback. That was certainly not deemed to be a distinguished education and something one does with an MBA. <laughs> Back then, I think people associated auctioneers with sort of, you know, hog sellers and tobacco <laughs> sellers and uh, sort of uh, defunct real estate uh, sellers and whatnot. Uh, <clears throat> but I thought, well, okay, this is a fascinating environment, the art auction uh, environment, which is really what it was. Wine, when I went, was just beginning at Christie's. So, so well, I'll, I'll try. Uh, you've asked me to do it. So I went through the in-house training course. And after six or eight weeks of mock auctions or whatnot, they throw you up there, basically see if you survive, give you the inexpensive stuff. So 30 lots of sort of the junk or the, the dregs of the estates uh, to auction off. And you can't lose too much money for the firm making mistakes with that. And of course, the hard bitten uh, antiques dealers are there to try and trip you up. And they say, oh, no, here comes another trainee auctioneer. So they make life difficult. And you're sort of hazed at the beginning. And if you oh, survive 30 lots, then they give you 100 lots. And you survive that, then you start doing sales sessions. So I became part of the regular auctioneering roster at uh, Christie's throughout the 1980s uh, when I was uh, living in, and based in New York. That seems just terrifying. I mean, when any of us think about even being in the audience and bidding, bidding alone seems terrifying, never mind standing up there and handling all of these different personalities and talking a mile a minute. And 
and God knows you have to know your stuff. You really have to know. Uh, in wine, I know, well, of course, you know an enormous amount about the lots that you auction. Um, yeah. Well, I never made it to Carnegie Hall to play the piano, but I think uh, I was probably as nervous as I would be <laughs> going on stage Carnegie Hall for the first time. To, to play the piano uh, when I did that, that first auctioneering. But auctioneering at its base is re really a, a technical, it's a skill or, or a knack in a way. I mean, you can, obviously you have to have a facility for numbers and you have to have enough of a stage presence to get people's uh, uh, attention. And you're sort, of a, you're sort of a host. So you have to have kind of a, a welcoming sense, make people feel, Welcome, but in terms of knowing what you're selling, I think you can get away really with pronouncing <laughs> it correctly <laughs> and using your your technical skills as an auctioneer to get through the auction. But it definitely does enhance things if you know a fair amount about what you're selling. So over time, while I would do uh, sales sessions for paintings, decorative arts, coins, stamps even, when I was at Christie's, in addition to traveling to Chicago to do the uh, help out with the wine auctions, after about a decade or so, I pretty much just restricted myself to wine auctions. That was my particular interest. And I think um, that's where I add some value because not just as being an auctioneer, but knowing something about uh, the subject. And so with regard to charity auctions, which I started doing in the uh, couple of years after I started to do uh, commercial auctions, that is in the early 80s, I pretty much stick to wine-related charity mm -hmm. auctions. Sure, I've done a few art charity auctions and school auctions, whatnot, but I really say if you, if you have wine in your auction, then you want to hire me, but uh, that's really what I, what I know. That's where my passion is. Well, you mentioned piano uh, a minute ago, and I, I know you went to college originally to study music. Did, do you think that that artistic training um, sort of was helpful in, in terms of ultimately uh, having a career in wine and, and then also at Christie's? Well, you know, there's a lot of people ascribe a certain amount of overlap uh, between music and wine in terms of the way it is appreciated, the, the pleasure of it is processed in the brain. In fact, neuroscientists uh, have, who obviously are wine fanciers, have looked into this and determined that the pleasure derived from wine and from music is processed in precisely the same uh, part of the brain. So, that's not to say that an interest in music is a predictor unnecessarily for an interest in wine, but there are a lot of musicians out there who uh, <laughs> struggling to make a living turn to selling wine. And uh, maybe I'm one of them, but, but having pursued a very kind of interesting route from music uh, uh, into wine, of course, not having given up music, I, I never was a pro, but I've, performed on and off uh, in a, on an amateur basis. So there is that, that overlap. And of course, with our, our wine uh, winery, Arietta, we've joined those passions. I've joined those two passions for classical music, music, but particularly classical music and wine uh, with the name Arietta, which means small, short aria, uh, and is taken from the last movement of the last Beethoven piano sonata, the Arietta movement. And we use musical terms from time to time in our uh, wine names. For instance, the white wine on the white keys, that's the melody of the Arietta is played on the white keys of the piano and whatnot. And we've used this musical theme as the underlying story of the brand even to the extent of allying the Arietta movement itself to the experience of drinking great wine uh, as it unfolds, where you start with something simple, in the case of wine, grapes, and in the case of the Arietta movement, a very simple song. And then you go forward through moments and sense or senses, shall we say, of increasing layering 
and complexity and finally arrive at a state of essentially nirvana or stasis or an, exalt, an exalted level of, of pleasure. And this is linked, our, this specific piece of music, and of course music in general, to our wine and has been the underpinning, the story of wine. And of course, that's so much of what wine is about. It's more than just what you're tasting. It's the, the romance in it, the story in it, the history of it, the people who have made it and what their passions are. So yeah. there they are. There, there's links on, on many levels. Well, you know, I'm, I'm uh, curious. I have to ask you this because uh, just the other day I was interviewing um, a, a vintner who is a winemaker too from um, South America who plays Gregorian chants to his, and occasionally um, something like, I don't know, Lady Gaga to his wine barrels in the cellar. And um, I, I know other people sort of like poo poo that idea. What is your, your feeling about actually playing music to your wine? Um, I think it's really, if I do, it's for my pleasure than more for the <laughs> wines itself. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of talk about, well, our, our original partner, John Konsgaard, loved to play Beethoven and other German music, Mahler, at full blast in the cellars. And people would go, oh, that was, that made quite an impression. I don't think that the 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 harmony of the the, of the spheres or whatever the <laughs> the musical waves really penetrates uh, the wine. I think what's being penetrated is our brains, really. So um, yeah. now at Arietta, you um, you work with a famous wine uh, maker who who does the actual making, Andy Erickson. Very famous, for a lot of people know him from Screaming Eagle or from Harlan or from Dalla Valle. Um, he has a, a list of uh, pretty top names, including yours, that he's worked with. Um, he's, a, he's a calm and nice person, but I'm wondering um, how much, you have such a good palate, as does your wife, Karen. I'm wondering how much creative control over the way your wine tastes do you have as opposed to uh, the control that Andy has? Well, I think it's very much a collaboration. And of course, that's made it interesting for Karen and, and me, because in, in my case, I've been very fortunate to taste very many great wines over the last 45 years of legal drinking. And uh, <laughs> so that has allowed me to form my own impression of what really not to, well, not really what good wine is, but what I think good wine is. And Andy, uh, on his side, uh, is, has stated, and this is really wonderful, he said, you know, I'm not here just to make another Andy Erickson wine. I'm here to make a wine that you do like. And so he works with us, the, the stylistic preferences that we express, we take part in all the, the blending of the finished wines. I'm really no good at the raw wine when it's in tank. That's really Andy and Patrick, our assistant winemaker's <coughs> um, role. But Andy knows the, and Patrick know the style that we like, which is to say we like brighter acidity. We don't like the wines to get out of control in terms of, of ripeness. That we like a vibrancy, a nervosité, the French would say. Uh, in the wines. They have to refresh. We think about wines when we start cooking dinner, really. We don't consider them uh, solo on a table with no other reference. Um, so they uh, uh, appreciate that. And they, if there are two ways to go with a wine, they'll move it in mm -hmm. our direction. But they mm -hmm. won't do something that they don't think is, is, is really good either. So it's been a wonderful collaboration in, in that respect. And it's nice to, to at least think that all those bottles of wine I've been fortunate enough to enjoy are having an effect on something, maybe some little effect on, on what we're creating with Arietta. Mm, beautifully said. Um, you know, I wanna go back to the piano for a second because I think you, you, know, you modestly said uh, that or suggested that uh, you might not have had a professional career. But I wonder if, if that was really true. I mean, you, you were a quite, um, qu 
quite successful concert pianist. Why did you decide to switch out of music and into, well, into English, excuse me, English literature in college and then uh, eventually into very different business occupations? Why not stay playing the piano? Well, I never really switched in at what I would consider to be a professional level or a level that promised a degree of, uh, well, let's just say <laughs> enough to support myself. It's a really, I mean, there's so many people who want to be musicians and there's so many great musicians and, 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 and pianists. Um, and I realized pretty early on, and I think fundamentally I'm, I'm a pretty risk averse person that may seem a strange thing to say when you see me flailing away in the middle of a charity auction. <laughs> but I thought, Mm, if I wasn't on Car the stage at Carnegie Hall by age 19, I was not going to, you know, make it to the level that where I would really have a, a really good career and be able to survive as a professional musician. And I was involved then with, I have made master tapes to the Aspen Music Festival when I was young and whatnot. So I rubbed shoulders with uh, enough professional musicians who helped me decide with their guidance that, you know, you can have more fun with music as an amateur than mm -hmm. you can have as a pro where you really are going from city to city and dragging yourself around and playing a lot of things you don't really want to play uh, to make a living. And I bought into that essentially. So when I did, I thought, okay, I'll be an English major and we'll go from here, but maybe I'll work as a professional um, performing arts manager. So when I left, I went to management school for that reason at Yale, yeah. and got what's now called an MBA. And my thought was then that my ideal job would be to be general director of the Metropolitan Opera. Well, that didn't quite happen, but I did end up in a place where there are a lot of divas and that's an art auction house. So in terms of being in a personality driven business, I was there and the course, it was fascinating to be, uh, I'm not an art expert, but I did learn a fair amount about paintings and decorative arts. And it was, of course, incredibly diverse. And auctioneering turned into my performance art. I mean, in a way, it's so extraordinary to think that that would turn out to be an outlet for the urge to um, perform. Yeah. So there it is. I, I have done some amateur performing and to my great good fortune with uh, some professional artists on occasion. So I have had a, enough of a taste of that to know what uh, I can do, you know, what I may have missed, but I, I really don't have any, any regrets. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, speaking of divas, and I'm thinking um, about all of these auctions and you have, of course, um, participated and run so many of them. Is, is there one where um, just something funny happened or the person was so outlandish that you'll absolutely never forget this moment? Well, there were a few, but the one that always comes to mind and some people were there who are, you know, remember, is when a John Schaefer secretly invited Robin Williams to come into the tent during an auction in Napa Valley in, I think it was 1998, and sell a lot. And it was a total surprise. And I barely knew before it was happening either. And it was such a surprise to the audience. He came on stage, of course, people went nuts just to see him. But he said, okay, everybody, I'm going to sell a lot. <laughs> and so I handed him the book. And the lot was called Fire and Ice. And it was a skiing trip to Aspen, I think, and followed by a trip to Hawaii, sort of a, you know, two themed auction lot, quite fancy. And so he, the, he extemporized in this lot and went into one of his manic modes, the likes of which uh, yeah, no one else had. And, and he started to talk, you know, fire and ice. So then he talked about, well, let's start with the ice, you know, Aspen, all that snow and all. It sort of really kind of went a little, started to get a little R-rated there with this description. And it was so manic and so wild that people 
got up and stood on the tables. They were beside themselves with laughter and hooting and hollering. And he went on for, I don't know, six, eight minutes in this wild monologue description and then he said okay let's start the bidding uh see what do i do here now uh, uh I, well uh well i'll bid fifty thousand. and uh then he said well nothing happened so he said fritz get over here he dragged me over and i said okay well come on let's go and so then you know so we were just arm to arm doing the bid i got 50 60 80 100 thousand I forget what it sold for. I think several hundred thousand dollars. But it was just the most oh. extraordinary moment. And to stand shoulder to shoulder with that kind of manic energy was a once in a lifetime experience. And I've been accused of having some sometimes in these auctions, but Robin Williams was, oh. you know, at a completely different level. <laughs> it was wild. I, I can uh, imagine. I actually was um, sent by Food and Wine magazine once to interview him because he had a vineyard. He, as you know, there was a time when he had a vineyard and um, he was in one of those manic moods. And I laughed so hard and he was so, you, you could only follow him if, he if you were there. I mean, I, I, for the first time in my life, I came back with a completely empty notebook. I had nothing to say. I had to apologize to Food and Wine magazine. I couldn't write the article because all I had done is spend an hour in hysterical laughter as he talked uh, at me. I know exactly what you mean. Oh, what a what a joy and what a treasure to have lost. Yeah, um, very sad. Uh, well, Fritz, tell us something. Uh, my, for my last question today, I want to ask you. Um, tell us something about you that most people would be surprised to learn. Wow, <laughs> that, that's a tough question to be uh, put on the spot about, surprised to learn. Mm. Well, um, I don't know, I kind of wear, wear my heart on my sleeve, so I'm not very good <laughs> at hiding things. Gosh, uh, well, I did, um, I actually have raced in a sailboat across the Atlantic Ocean. Well, well, that's pretty big, my goodness. So I did some op open ocean sailing, never as a captain, but as a crew uh, up until the mid nineties, raced uh, out the gate and whatnot. So sailing was a pretty big uh, part Ooh. of growing up for me and my family. We're from Michigan. And I guess just the fact that I'm from Michigan, maybe that <laughs> I'm a Midwesterner. That is surprising, so, actually. Um, uh, actually, that's wonderful. I can uh, I can see it right now. Um, well, Fritz, thank you so much for joining us, and for all of our viewers, thank you for joining us. And you um, will really want to check out the complete interview with Fritz Hatton. It is something I. I promise you won't want to miss. For now, I'm Karen McNeil. It's good to be with you.